there is so much hype in the advanced air mobility sector that it can be hard to get the story straight as an aviation reporter in this dynamic new world of electric aviation. And that's why I was so glad to catch up with Sergio Jacuta. He's a bona fide independent expert consultant in this field. And I was able to get his take on how excited we should be about new EVATOL aircraft and other breakthroughs. Well, supposedly, 2025 will be a big, big year with the first commercial air services, including air taxis, getting off the ground. But are the front runners ready, I wonder? And does it actually matter whether these deadlines slip? There is still a lot of work to be done. I mean, as I've said many times, the constant in aerospace is we're always late. Um, and we're not late because we're not good. We're late because we're creating some of the most difficult products to put in the market. And we have no room for error. Uh, because our priority number one is to make sure that you don't have to worry when you fly. As you don't worry when you wake up and get out of bed, you shouldn't worry when you go on an airplane. And so I think there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. And, uh, and I think that that is a little bit of a reflection of why you see a lot of the companies maybe not being so vocal with announcement or anything. It's a little bit of a lull because now it's just roll up your sleeve, start working. Most of the industry is more of a push industry. We have a great technology. We think there is a public there that wants it, and so we want to come out with it. But there is no one that is waiting for it. I mean, I think it's a great technology, but no one of the CDs, no one of us has gone to our mayor and says, can I get any veto because I want to fly to work? So when it comes to these, there is a lot of push from the investors to show progress and I think the many press releases are a byproduct of showing constant progress uh, because we've never seen it before in aerospace. In aerospace, we've always been very few milestones that move along. I mean, I don't think any one of us knew about G1, G2 and all of this deal of certification unless you were a DER. But now we're all mini experts on all of these milestones. Uh, and I, I do think that, uh, yeah, there is this pressure to execute. But you will, you're also seeing this second generation of vehicles that don't have this pressure to execute. And so how is it going to happen? How is this market going to be when they walk in? The FAA is going to be now a very expert regulator by that point because you're going to have a few beetles under her belt. Uh, and again, we also don't have to underestimate the task of the FAA. I mean, they're learning a new technology and then they have to test and make sure that they can test the new technology. So it's a little bit like they have going to school, learning everything and then testing it. And it's, that's why, I mean, even big regulator like FAA and EASA are, you know, taking their time to understand all of the intricacies of these products. We've reported on literally hundreds of advanced air mobility pioneers since AIAN launched the Future Flight platform in 2019. But so many of these have now fallen by the wayside. So is it a case of winner takes all in the EVATOL race to market? It's not a zero sum game right now. I mean, I, I like to say that this is the period of the industry, it's the period of tides, meaning the tide raises all boats. So right now, one company's success is everyone's success. Same thing, and one company failure could have repercussion on this whole industry, especially if it's something bad. Um, but when it comes to this, I would say that for sure the second wave will have an advantage on the first wave. But you can also see the flip side of the coin. This is not another airplane where you just need to follow the regulation, you put it in an airport and it works like everything else. This is a completely new form of transportation on which I think there is a lot of unknown unknowns and until you start doing it you don't know i mean it's the same it's the famous problem with sports right you see people play on tv and you're like yeah that's not difficult then you try to do it yourself and you're like well it's very difficult and so this is the part where these folks by the time the second generation comes in will have learned a lot and none of them is going to put a how do we veto book out for everyone to read but maybe in fact there are different paths to commercial success that could see more frugal 
patient startups rewarded in the longer term. And what about the also rants? Could their talents end up being cherry picked by rivals? It's not how much money you've raised, it's more about how you've used the capital you have raised. And so, and, uh, and that is an important point. There could be companies that will come significantly cheaper than others to do the same things. However, especially in today's investor climate, it's really difficult to see how if you raised 40, 50, 100 million, how do you get to this finish line? And I mean, and another thing that we've seen, I mean, Joby we know has spent a billion already. There is other company that already has spent in the high hundreds of million, if not billions. So we know that this price tag that comes with it is probably shifting to the two billion. And so it's getting to be a little bit more complex. However, different strategies from the supply chain side, different involvement of the strategic investors are making it difficult to compare, oh, this guy is at this much money. And not only that, there is two other things. We don't talk about the fact that when production starts, the cash spend increases significantly. And last but not least, we also talk about business model. Some people will sell $5 million airplanes, some people will sell $300 tickets. And so the cash needs are gonna be very different. Uh, what we know is that at the end, cash is king. Uh, and these companies, they're not gonna fail because their technology is bad. They're not gonna fail because they don't have great people. I think probably most of the brightest mind right now are in this industry. It's going to be, do they have the runway to get there? When it comes to consolidation, we don't see a lot of M&A activity. Um, for the simple for M of the A, the merger part, for the simple reason that a lot of these companies are developing perfect substitutes. So why buy the same things you've already done? If you thought that the other idea was better than yours, you would have done it that way, not your way. And so what we see, we see failures, then followed by acquisition of a patent portfolio, and then the spreading of the talent. However, one of the things that we've started to think lately, and we thought in the past, there could be a way for people that are developing this similar vehicle to create a product family. It could be. Because Uber Elevate has taught us wing is the best. But is it? Uh, I mean, the whole Uber Elevate was modeled on American cities. American cities are a little bit of a corner case in the world of cities. Uh, cities are usually very densely populated. We're kind of like the opposite. Uh, and to anyone that thinks New York, New York doesn't count. Um, so is there a need for different individuals for different markets. Um, and so there could be some of that that I think comes into play. To convince financial backers they can expect a strong return on investment, many companies are promising unprecedented scaling up in this industry. But it's hard to see how this could be achieved based on how things stand as we now enter the final quarter of 2024. The industry will be supply limited at the beginning. I mean, it's true that there is a lot of capacity that's getting put in place for production, but it is pales in comparison to what we need to do. And many times we're putting down buildings, but just because there is square footage doesn't mean the whole building is full of machinery to make airplanes. So sometimes when you hear this plan can make up to this many aircraft, there is a date that comes with the up to. Safety is at the foremost for the industry. And so you want to do one step at a time. And, and it's in no one best interest to trip because they're going fast. And so we think there is going to be a scaling, but the scaling is going to be over a period of years, not over a period of weeks or months. Having aircraft delivered is one thing. Having places for them to operate with the right support could prove to be quite another, as companies scramble to get the so-called ecosystem in place. I think the infrastructure gets a whole pass at the beginning, yeah. because we're probably going to use something that already exists. Yeah. So, I mean, the truth is for an FBO, creating a vertibort is as easy as putting a charger in the ground. Yeah. And boom, a vertibort is born. It might be on the wrong side of the airport, uh, or maybe not at the beginning, because maybe the customers are the one that don't go to the side of the airport that us common people go. Um, but at the same time, I think that we get a whole pass on the infrastructure because we can use what we have. Now, the difficult part is going to be the infrastructure we have is not enough to make this vision become true. Because otherwise, we already have stuff that can go from an airport to another airport. 
And so at that point, we'll need to build more. However, it's a problem that is extremely complex. Because before, you dealt with a regulator and a country. Now you need to deal with every single city that has different constituency, different interests, different issues. And so it's not going to be easy. And just because the formula worked in a city doesn't mean it can be replicated in another. Well, one question I often get asked, and I don't really have a great answer for, is why do Evertel aircraft designs look so different? Wouldn't it make more sense to agree on an optimum design and have all these aircraft look quite similar, just like today's airliners tend to? I think there will be a convergence. I think it's way too early to talk about any existing design. Even when we talk about vector trust, I mean, if you take a Joby and if you take a Vertigo, they're similar, but very different. And so even when it comes to the same bucket of vehicle, vector trust, there is very much difference between the two. And to tell you the truth, at the end, the proof is in the pudding, and the pudding doesn't come until the regulator says so. So let's wait for this vehicle to be certified, and then we can do some assumption and say, oh, this vehicle is much better than this other vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. And again, there is no vehicle that performs without a specific mission. So we need to be very careful. A fighter, it's not good for transporting people, but it's very good at what it does. And so it's the same thing here. There could be some EVITAL that are great in some mission, there could be some EVITAL that are great for other mission, and the configuration that they have could show this disparity or dissimilarity. And again, if we go back to this talking about CDs, right now in the world there is 628 CDs above a million, and it's only gonna grow. And so in some parts, in some other parts of the world, we actually want to have CD that depopulate, but that's a problem for the end of the century. And so can different cities need different EVTOLs? So I think it's a little bit early. We know that the vector trust configuration is the most efficient, but it also comes with complexity. Well, finally, I pushed Sergio on the current propulsion holy grail issue, batteries. Could they end up getting sidelined by advances in other fuel sources, such as hydrogen. We like batteries, um, they're getting better, but we always have to deal with the fact that even considering a 50% efficiency in a turbine or an ice engine, you still have 6,000 watt hour per kilogram as opposed to 250. So there is a lot of 10% improvement you need to make to get there. Um, so if you think that 8% a year, means doubling every 80 years, there's a lot of time that we need to spend to get there. And one of the things that we've seen is for urban mission, absolutely, batteries are perfect. However, there is a lot of other mission where maybe the help of another energy source helps. And so we've seen military interested in hybridization because they can get a lot more range. And hybridization, we don't have to be restrictive. A hydrogen airplane is a hybrid. It's just a different type of hybrid. Uh, I, I like to think it carries their own power plant to produce electricity. Um, and a generator is the same thing. So I think we are going to see more of this, um, a little bit like opposite of what the car did. The car went from hybrid to electric. I think we're gonna go from electric to hybrid, but in not necessarily the same platform. Like, I don't think anyone can think that Joby is going to take an S4 and make it into a hydrogen airplane. The hydrogen airplane is going to be different. Uh, it will be able to get more payload. And, I mean, if Evito could take more people, we'll make them bigger. But it's, there is a limitation in the battery. And maybe Zora Aviation will prove us all wrong. Um, but the other part is we need to make different airplanes. And at a certain point, when we start flying for an hour, an hour and a half, hopefully we put toilets on it. <laughs> because that would be a bad thing. So I would say look at all of this as demonstration of what can be done, but I think at a certain point you will see product families of different vehicles. I've always appreciated Sergio's balance of optimism and realism. From his close-up exposure to advanced air mobility, it's clear this is a when, not if moment for aviation. And if you want to hear from more experts like him, Stay with AIN for our exclusive coverage of the aviation industry's revolutionary vanguard. There's news every day at aianonline.com slash futureflight. And you'll also find 
plenty more videos like this one.